Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Lendi Ruano, and I am with Easter Seals of Southern California and the Disability Trife Initiative. Today's live webinar, A Vision for a Thriving Direct Support Professional Workforce, will be offering Spanish and ASL interpretation. Next slide, please. Para las personas que necesitan o prefieren el español, Usted puede acceder a este servicio haciendo clic en el icono con el globo blanco en la parte baja de su pantalla, que dice Interpretation. Después, haga clic en Spanish y aquí tendrá la opción de silenciar, de silenciar el audio original y podrá escuchar la voz de Mark Gutiérrez traduciendo. En el canal de español tendrá la opción de seleccionar Mute Original Audio y escuchará solamente al intérprete. Si no lo selecciona, entonces escuchará a los presentadores de habla inglés al fondo. If you prefer to listen in English, please stay with the original sound. If you select English, you will hear silence. Our ASL interpreter, Destiny Bradford, has been spotlighted so she can always be seen throughout the presentation. Depending on your device, this may mean that sometimes you cannot see the presenter. We apologize for the inconvenience, but we want to make sure that this live meeting and recording can be accessible to everyone. This presentation will have closed captioning, which you can access by using the button at the bottom of the screen. Next slide, please. A few things to note about Zoom before we get started. This meeting is being recorded to allow us to refer to today's discussion and the input we receive. You can hear and see us, but we cannot hear and see you. Everyone has been automatically put on mute and your camera is not on. Chat is not activated for attendees. However, presenters will be sharing some information through the chat during the webinar. If you would like to ask a question or provide a comment, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. As a reminder, please indicate who your question or comment is for. We do have staff monitoring and responding as necessary. Some questions will be answered in real time, or we may ask you for your email address so that we can follow up after the webinar. Si necesita hacer preguntas o comentarios en español, lo puede hacer utilizando la caja que dice QIA. Tenemos personal bilingüe asistiendo. Finally, at the end of today's webinar, we will be asking you to participate in our post-event survey. Once the webinar is over, a new window will pop open with the survey. Please provide your feedback and let us know how we did. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce Executive Director at California Disability Services Association, Barry Giardini, and Amber Carey Navarrete, Director of Person Center and Culture Practices at Easter Seals of Southern California. Barry, Amber? All right, well, thank you so much, Lundy, for that introduction. And on behalf of Barry and myself, I'd like to welcome everyone here today and thank you for your attendance. I am so glad that we get to present on the topic of our amazing direct support professional workforce who supports the dreams and aspirations of those using our services each and every day. Next slide. Now, the continued success of our disability workforce is a priority at every level across the state, and we are fortunate today to hear about the latest workforce development initiatives from the Department of Developmental Services as well as the regional center's view on the disability workforce. We are lucky to have a panel of direct support professionals to share what their careers look like in action. Then as we cl close out this, our final Disability Thrive Initiative webinar of 2022, we will be reflecting on the training series in its entirety and all of the support it took to make it happen. Next slide. It is now my honor to introduce Catherine Knight, Assistant Deputy Director with the California Department of Developmental Services, Office of Statewide Clinical Services, here to share the department's workforce development, DSP training stipend, and other initiatives. Next slide. 
Also behind the scenes answering your questions in the Q&A is Yasir Ali, Northern Regional Manager, Office of Community Operations, and Julia Lowe, Assistant Director of Programs. My thanks to the entire DDS team. Please take it away, Catherine. Good afternoon, and thank you so much for that warm introduction, Amber. It's my pleasure to be here with you all today to discuss direct services workforce development efforts. We recognize there is a, national, a nationwide workforce shortage and recruiting and retaining a knowledgeable skilled workforce has become extraordinarily challenging. A shortage of direct service workers has direct impact on the individuals who depend upon their services. There is no single solution and it is necessary to take a multifaceted approach to address these challenges. DDS has established several initiatives to address different areas of need and lay a foundation for future efforts to come. This includes addressing workforce development and stabilization, developing the quality incentives program, and identifying regional center performance measures. This is an ongoing process and we are glad for the opportunity to share more information with you all today. Next slide. The Budget Act of 2021 authorized funding to develop programs to enhance direct service worker wages and also improve the quality of services provided and consumer outcomes. These programs include DSP Workforce Training and Development, which is commonly referred to as DSP University, and the DSP Bilingual Differential. Both of these concepts were introduced with the rate models that followed the 2019 rate study by Burns and Associates. A work group comprised of over 32 members, including self-advocates, family members, service providers, regional centers, and other partners were engaged to provide input on the implementation of these initiatives. Both DSP University and Bilingual Differential are projected to be available in the summer of 2023. Next slide. DSPs who can communicate in a language or medium other than English and who complete bilingual certification will receive a monthly pay differential. While not finalized yet, this differential will likely be an additional $100 per month when a DSP becomes certified. Bilingual certification aims at building capacity of bilingual and multilingual staff within the intellectual and developmental disability service system and increasing regional center consumers access to staff who speak or communicate using their preferred language, including American Sign Language. We are currently working on contracting for a management of a certification process to ensure DSPs are proficient in their languages. Through this initiative, we are building a list of bilingual DSPs throughout the state, which will be helpful in assessing where we have high or low capacity and needs. Next slide, please. The DSP University is a three-tiered training and certification program for DSPs and frontline supervisors. This training and certification program supports the workforce with three to six dollars per hour could be earned at work, which would apply if a DSP has a second or third job. DSP University provides access to quality job specific training for DSPs through standardized competency based training curriculum. Work has been done to establish core competencies and priorities for this program through engagement with the DSP workforce work group and we are working to establish a, con a contract with an organization to manage the program and identify Hi, Catherine. Um, Thanks. Thanks. Hi, Catherine. I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, your, your internet seemed to go out just a little bit. If you if you could back up a little, we 
We lost you for a little minute there. Oh, I apologize. Okay. I, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, so the DSP University provides access to quality job specific training for DSPs through standardized competency based training curriculum. Work has been done to establish core competencies and priorities for the program through engagement with the DSP workforce work group. And we are working to establish a contract with an organization to manage the program and identify resources for training content that is most relevant to DSPs and developmental services in California. Development of this career pathway will support recruitment and retention efforts, enhance quality of services provided, and foster an improved consumer experience. DSP University will provide DSPs with transferable training experience and records. Rollout of this initiative will include future outreach to DSPs to help bring awareness of the opportunity and to get the word out. Next slide, please. Based on projected regional center caseload growth, it is estimated that we will need to increase the workforce by approximately 33,000 DSPs and 2,700 regional center service coordinators over the next five years. While the workforce development initiatives are coming together for the next year, a short-term strategy is needed to stabilize the workforce. The Budget Act of 2022 authorized funding to develop programs relating to developmental services workforce stabilization, namely the DSP training stipend program, DSP internship program, tuition reimbursement program for regional center employees, and the pilot of remote supports using technology solutions, each of which I will cover a in a bit more detail on the next few slides and all are anticipated to be available by the summer of 2023. These initiatives were authorized to help retain, restore and support the frontline workforce. Next slide, please. Through the DSP training stipend, DSPs may receive up to two training stipends amounting to $500 each upon completion of authorized training courses. DDS has contracted with the National Alliance for Direct Support Professionals, or NADSP, for training courses relevant to DSPs, which will be available online or on a mobile device. The first training offered will be the DSP Code of Ethics by NADSP that we are really excited to bring to you. DSPs will, will be able to choose the second training from a selection of available courses. This training stipend program will have a soft rollout in January of 2023 with one regional center to ensure the online training platform is easily accessible to DSPs with full rollout anticipated very shortly after. We look forward to this being a good experience and are hopeful to have many DSPs participate. Next slide. The DSP internship program, which is similar to the paid internship program, is geared towards creating new opportunities. This program is aimed at recruiting people to the developmental services system at entry level. A third party will manage recruitment and intern placement with service providers, allowing service providers to benefit from having interns while alleviating the burden of recruitment, onboarding, cost of wages, and other responsibilities. Interns will benefit from exposure to a new service sector with, with a soft landing and quality training. This we hope will lead to post-internship employment for people who may not have otherwise found their way to developmental services. Intern wages are funded by the state for three months with funding that allows for retention stipends for post-internship employment. This program too is anticipated to be available in 2023. Next slide, please. The tuition reimbursement program offers tuition reimbursement for regional center employees who seek advanced degrees in a health, and, a health or human services related field. 
This program is developed to support recruitment, retention, and career development for regional center employees and is aimed at enhancing the quality of services provided to those receiving regional center services. DDS is currently working with regional centers on the program specifications uh, with anticipated um, availability in 2023. Next slide, please. The pilot for remote supports is intended to test the feasibility of remote supports provided to individuals using technology solutions. There are so many technology solutions that can support people with having greater independence. And as a result, can reduce reliance on in-person direct supports. This pilot will support individuals to live more independent lives as all technology services will be based on the individual needs of that specific individual. Services can include things like sensors in the home and electronic medication dispensers. It could also provide instant on-call assistance in which the individual would use a handheld device like an iPad to connect with the call center. Staff at the call center would have the availability a bit, excuse me, the ability to converse with the individual and provide immediate assistance. There are so many potential uh, innovations. A focus group has been working to scope the pilot and has been exploring criteria for selecting participants, for training providers, um, how to protect participants' privacy, and how to measure success. Participants are anticipated to be identified by spring of 2023. Next slide, please. The Quality Incentives Program is not new, so I will not spend much time on it, but I do want to tie this to the department's approach to the direct services workforce. The Quality Incentives Program for service providers has been established after a year of discussion with an active stakeholder work group. As you may remember, the Disability Thrive Initiative has brought several components of quality incentives programs to you this year. In September, DDS presented on incentives programs for helping individuals achieve competitive integrated employment. Before that, in the June webinar on helping California address the DSP's uh, workforce crisis, DDS presented on the DSP Workforce Data Collection Survey. We received about 2,300 responses, which represents roughly 42% of service providers. Through the Quality Incentives Program, DDS is laying a foundation for collecting data needed to address workforce shortages, turnover rates, longevity, and language fluency. Next slide, please. Regional Center performance measures were launched in the fall of 2022. Aligned with the focus areas of the Quality Incentives Program for service providers, regional centers are also incentivized for building up their service coordinator capacity, knowledge, facilitation skills, and cultural competency. I, will, I won't go into too much detail here, but there is a link included in case you want to learn more about this. The intent Hey, Catherine. Uh, I'm sorry to barge in again, but we lost you there for a moment. My apologies. Um, I hope you can hear me now. Um, but mm -hmm, I just can. wanted to highlight the department's intent uh, to illustrate a multifaceted approach to building up the frontline workforce from all angles. Next slide, please. Uh, I'd like to again thank you for the opportunity to talk with you. Well, unfortunately, Catherine, we're, we're still uh, getting your internet issues, but um, it looks like if anyone has any questions around this, you can send an email to dspworkforce at dds.ca.gov. 
And Catherine, I want to thank you for being on with us today to share uh, the new programs and priorities of the department to address the DSP workforce crisis and uh, appreciate you being with us today. Thank you. And next up, um, we are joined by Tony Anderson, the executive director of the Valley Mountain Regional Center. Uh, Tony is going to give us a regional center view on the disability workforce and uh, give us maybe a little more detail on some of the uh, policies that were just shared and um, give his perspective. So Tony, really great to have you here today. I uh, appreciate you being with us. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. I really appreciate the time and the good work of the Disability Thrive Initiative and, uh, and having the Regional Center perspective in here as well. You may wonder why, but uh, I want you to know that I'm joining with all of my colleagues in the Regional Centers that uh, our direct support workforce, the direct support professionals in California are critically important to all of us. Um, it is the, the, the place of the highest quality. It's the touch point and uh, anything that we can all do to focus on uh, making sure that we have a, a great uh, DSP workforce that's serving people with disabilities and families, uh, we have to keep doing that. And uh, this is a great effort here. So I just wanted to take that second there to, to thank you. And also I wanna start here with uh, some really exciting initiatives uh, for the regional centers themselves and, uh, and, and our folks who come in direct contact with people with developmental disabilities. So this year there was a, a pretty sizable investment on uh, that went to the regional centers for the service coordinators. And those of you who are not familiar with service coordinators, those are the, the social workers, those are the ones that, who go out into the field and, and connect with people with disabilities and their families and talk about goals and, and uh, the kinds of person-centered um, services that people need and want and, uh, and, and how they make their way throughout society. So uh, very important that we have um, a robust workforce and we're gonna have a lot more service coordinators this year. So this is a very important time to make this investment, not only the investment to get our caseload ratios down to where they should be, but then as we get a whole bunch of new people uh, that we concentrate on the, the training of those new people and, uh, and then the investment and in the people that are here already. So uh, the one of the things I wanted to highlight here uh, was that there's a college degrees and certificates sort of a program that was mentioned a minute ago. Um, it's a tuition reimbursement program and uh, it's very exciting uh, for us, there's a it's it's up to ten thousand dollars a year uh, for as many as three years, um, and that's for the tuition reimbursement. Um, so the when I said uh, three years, it's up to the three years, uh, and then you have to make a, in exchange you would make a commitment to stay in the regional center if you receive those three years. You would you would commit to three years, so it's it actually is a year for year commitment. So uh, uh, for each year that you receive a reimbursement for the, for the tuition, uh, then you would promise to stay for that particular year. And so that's why it, it, you could do it three times and then you would commit to staying with that regional center for three years. So that's, that's pretty neat. Um, there are other things that regional centers may have had over the years, so, some, um, some time off to go uh, to college or uh, paid time off sometimes or different things, but this is the largest um, sort of investment in this area. Um, regional centers, you could, you could transfer also. So if you were a, a service coordinator and you were in this program um, and you, now you moved and went to another area and you wanted to still be a service coordinator, you could still maintain this, the, this uh, tuition reimbursement program, and you're just transferred to another regional center. So that, that was a really good part of this. And you would then, uh, there's some reporting that the original regional center would have to do uh, so that everybody was informed, DDS was informed, and then the new regional center also would then uh, take you on. And then there's reporting there as well, so that there's some, there's some oversight on the program uh, and that, so that we make sure that it, it achieves what it's intended to do. Um, so uh, next slide, please. 
So there are a few things that uh, still need to be uh, worked through and the Association of Regional Center Agencies, uh, ARCA and uh, the Department of Developmental Services have been working uh, very close on this, this initiative for some time. They're still working through some of these other parts that need to be determined uh, for the program. So we should be hearing soon uh, what the final outcome is and what, what the program will look like. But um, so they'll, the, the question about uh, tuition, uh, the program, the placements, like what types of colleges or what kind, types of programs or even certificates uh, would be uh, eligible, um, different, uh, different uh, college programs, what would, what kind of credentialing would it have to be? Uh, they want to. We want to be really clear that it's for uh, you know um, the types of degrees that are necessary. Most of the regional center physicians uh, do require college degrees, so that is one of the other reasons for doing something like this. Um, the other is the the application submission. We want to have a, a sort of a process for that, so that it's standard across the board that everybody would have the same. Uh, type of um, application that they would put in, um, and then what are the guidelines around that? Um, then we're also discussing work requirements during and after the program. So, uh, how much would they have to work while they're in college, and uh, what would that look like? Um, and then also, the the other question is: so after the program, after you graduated, so what? When would you start to? When does that commitment start? Uh, and if you don't uh, graduate, uh, it's a, it just didn't work out for you, and you, you're not going to graduate, what does that timeline look like to make that decision? And then um, how would you have to pay back uh, the, the money? So uh, repayment plans for non-graduates is another piece of it. So there are quite a few different things that are uh, needing to be worked out. Um, but it's just, we've been working on this for quite some time. And uh, again, it's very exciting. Uh, you know, we're a lot of regional centers. We're, we're in the middle of uh, a lot of uh, our recruitment efforts, talking to a lot of potential new service coordinators. And then also amongst our administrative staff who maybe they don't have college degrees. There's a lot of excitement there as well. So it's a really nice new program that will, it's an investment on the staff that will be working directly uh, with people with developmental disabilities and their families. Uh, next slide, please. Um, regional centers uh, annual progress reports. So again, on the accountability, we want to make sure that the investment is achieving what we're intending for it to achieve. So there'll, there'll be the initial uh, report and then there will be uh, an annual report after that. So so that we would continue to see how the program is working. So, and, and then there we'll put um, information about the demographics, where people are coming from, um, the, and the uh, other information about the applicants and, and the participants, the where in the state uh, the, the regional centers are coming from, uh, which regional centers are participating, the types of degrees are going to be important. We wanna see what types of degrees the service that the, the the staff are taking um so we'll be looking at that and then time being employed by the regional center after their degree so that that's one of the goals is that they would you would uh have this investment in an individual and they would uh, get their college degree and they would get really excited about being part of the this this community and they would continue to work in the field and that we would then have people that stayed for a long time. You may hear every now and then people talk about that they have a different service coordinator a lot. There's a lot of turnover sometimes in, in different um, regions. And uh, it's really, you know, it's something that that confuses people and it's just not, not uh, what people want. People would like to have somebody who's a service coordinator for many years that knows them well and um, knows what their goals have been and you know how they've evolved in their interest. And, and just having the same person uh, brings a lot of comfort to many people. Uh, sometimes new people are very good too, but there are a lot of, lot of people who would like to have the, the comfort in knowing that they've had this long-term relationship 
with their social work. So we want to see does this program here achieve that effect. So there'll, there'll be some reporting on that. And uh, like I said before, the Association of Regional Center Agencies at the department are still working on these details and, and many others that, that come up. Uh, next slide. And then um, what I did want to add too is that there are a lot of different changes that are in the budget that um, are also really helpful for the existing, the current uh, service coordinators in, uh, throughout the state. And I just kind of want to make a quick mention of those because I think they were important as well. The early childhood caseloads uh, now at one to 40 is a, a really nice thing for service coordinators, gives them more time to spend with people uh, when their caseloads can be this low. Um, that's one of the, the complaints that a lot of service coordinators have is that they just don't have the, the time that they want to be able to spend with with people with disabilities or with little children or, or their families and give them the quality uh, effort that, that they really want to. So this is a big help for, for the service coordinators. Um, funding to hire service coordinators to comply with caseload requirements like the ratios, and that's for uh, all different types of service coordinators. So we're, we're finally going to be having our caseloads down to the ratios that are that are in our, our waiver, and uh, we're excited to see that. And again, it has to do with giving uh, service coordinators the caseloads that are manageable, so that they can do the work that they are really wanting to do. It really uh, drives them and um, meets their passion in serving people with disabilities. Um, this remote planning uh, that has been going on since the pandemic and extending that out to June was very helpful. Um, it's very, a, a point of stress for, for many families. It was also for some um, service coordinators as well. So having that period of time uh, to care for yourself and, and if the family didn't want to have the face-to-face -face meetings yet uh, to give that um, remote meetings more time to play out. And so that was very helpful. Uh, for the workforce. And then the family cost participation program and annual family feed program uh, suspensions. I have to say uh, that that uh, suspension has been uh, a w very um, well received uh, initiative that was in the budget. Um, and it really the, uh, the service coordinators, um, really this is, a, this is an area that causes sometimes great pain, frustration, uh, and it hurts the relationship um, often between the service coordinator and the and the families. And so having that suspended for the amount of time that it has been has been very helpful and continuing it has been helpful. And we just hope that it continues beyond that. But that is another thing. And then finally, there's really neat uh, new program that we're all looking at. And this is language access and cultural competence grants. And uh, it's giving all of the regional centers these opportunities to, to make sure that we can uh, develop more of our, our resources and our information to people in ways that they will best receive it. So in different languages, so that we have um, translation of our written documents and, and interpretation for all of our presentations as well. And, uh, we're using it at our regional center to, to, to build up that resource and so that we can do that faster. So we're um, really excited about those, those initiatives. And I think I have one more slide, please. And oh, the last thing, I have been working in this space of uh, direct support professionals and, and addressing the, 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 what has been identified as the crisis for a long time. But I would, did want to recognize that um, in 2017, uh, there was a report to the president uh, from the president's committee on intellectual and developmental disabilities. It was called America's Direct Support Workforce Crisis Effects on People with Intellectual Disabilities, Families, and the Community, and the U.S. Economy. And uh, this has been around now for a few years, and they had these recommendations about the workforce. And so this is what they had laid out, that, the, that there should be rate-setting methodologies to include better compensation uh, across the country, technology solutions, 
um, provide training and technology to agencies to make them more effective um, and more effective as a as a community entity. Uh, incentives for states to expand the pool of drug support professionals, uh, promote self direction and um, self uh, directed services like the participant directed services. Um, recognize uh, direct support professional as a distinct occupation uh, title, it's very important, and recognize direct support professionals more accurately, meaning in their job classifications, instead of just a uh, home aide or a teacher or a counselor, these are the general terms that you might hear, but to make it more standard as a profession. And then the better use of community colleges and job centers for training, and then finally develop online matching registry services. And I bring these up because um, I am happy to report that uh, I did want to link that there are many things that we're talking about today that address these uh, goal areas that the, the, the president's committee reported. So you go to the next slide, and I think it's my final slide. And uh, so some of the things that would highlight is the, uh, the money for um, the, the training stipends with direct support professionals that directly links into some of the, the points that were made. Uh, the three month DSP training and internship program, again, uh, linked to those. And the, if you think of the college parts and the American job parts, and then the um, $5 million to pilot the development of uh, technology use, which is directly uh, spelled out in the, in the president's um, committee. And so um, I think that might be my last slide. And then I guess we could try one more in case it's not. Oh, that was my last slide. So I just wanted to say thank you. Um, should I be, I should have been looking at the Q&A. So um, I'll look at any of those. I didn't have anybody to monitor that for me because none of my staff uh, knew the answers anyway. That's what they told me. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Tony. We appreciate that and appreciate all the great information. And yeah, if you have a few minutes to check out that q and I'm sure people will appreciate it. Um, it was just so great to hear about the new investments and opportunities for regional centers and our disability workforce. So again, thank you for your time here today. You're welcome. Now, we knew we couldn't have a DSP webinar without hearing from our disability workforce themselves. So next, I have the great pleasure of introducing a few direct support professionals from around the state to share about their work in action and what keeps them engaged and motivated each and every day. I would like to welcome to our panel discussion, Lupita C.A., Artist Mentor with Al Camilla, Christina Boutte, DSP with Into Vision, and Sandra Ibarra, DSP with Milestones of Development. Please do all come on camera now and we can get our discussion started. Great, thank you so much for being here. I think hopefully Sandra will be able to join us in just a minute here, getting all the tech figured out. While we wait, um, I believe for many of us in this field, uh, we find that the work that we do and the services we provide to be somewhat of a calling. Yet that being said, there are things that the organizations we work for can do that let us know we are valued and appreciated and keep us motivated even during the toughest of times. For example, you know, a couple of years of pandemic, shall we say. I know that each of you have been with your organizations for a number of years, and I would love to hear about what your organization does that keeps you motivated and engaged in your work. So I'm just gonna kind of use my Zoom screen here, and if each of you would uh, take a turn coming off mute and, and sharing a bit about what you really appreciate from your organization and how they appreciate you. So Lupita, would you get us started? Hi, I'm Lupita. I'm from Alchemia. I'm an artist mentor, and Alchemia is a nonprofit arts program in Sonoma and Marin counties for adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, and we have two working galleries in Petaluma and Nevada that showcase our art artist work. Alchemia often performs in our local theaters, festivals, and participate 
engagement through our galleries and studios. And um, yeah, Alchemia supports us by having online paid trainings. Um, we, throughout the uh, pandemic, we were on Zoom. On Zoom, we also did weekly meetings um, so that there is some transparency throughout the organization. We also had weekly updates uh, through email um, regarding our program, the state, and also the artists. And our uh, Alchemia really supports uh, um, our team to be fulfilled in their personal lives and um, being as uh, flexible as possible. Thank you so much. <laughs> Communication, connection, that is really so important in the work that we do. Um, Christina, please join the conversation. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Yes, my name is Christina Boutte, and I'm with Into Vision. Um, the reason for me working with Into Vision is that the people that I work with from the office and also the uh, consumers, we have it if the consumer calls out, they make sure that I get proper hours. Uh, my clothes. Uh, oh. Okay. I'm sorry. Oh, no what problem. Motivates... You were going on and off the mute there, so I wasn't oh. sure if we missed something. Um, what motivates me with Into Vision is I, like I said, it's the people here at the office, it's the consumers that I work with. Um, and we have things that we do that keep me focused is oh God, why? clients that I work with, we do volunteering, health and fitness, and money management, self-advocacy. And so we're busy doing that. Um, I I like working for Into Vision when I said earlier is because they take good care of me um, when it comes to sometimes the clients call out sick or they cancel service. I'm able to gain more hours from the other clients that need help. Uh, what else? Um, I, we did a lot of Zoom, and during the Zoom classes, we did book club, we did health and fitness, and we also did movies, also arts and crafts. So that was a blessing. That kept me very busy also. So that's part of them taking good care of us. Yeah, it sounds doing... like, excuse me. But it sounds like the consistency, right? So, yes. so it's not just necessarily that the people who are using your service need that need you mm -hmm. consistently, but the fact that your organization was able to provide that consistency for you as well, and and the um, the connection once again, kind of yes. we're seeing going here, the connection you have with the with your leadership. So, um, hopefully, does that summarize it pretty well? Yes, it does, Amber. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you for sharing. It sounds like you have a lot of really great stuff happening there and we're able to maintain it throughout throughout all this time. So Sandra, yeah. please go ahead and, and join our conversation. Hi, my name is Sandra Ibera and I'm here in Vallejo, California and I work for Milestones of Development. It's a nonprofit organization serving adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities. I've been here for 20 plus years. What holds me here? is doing all the things I get to do with people that enjoy seeing my crazy face every day. <laughs> not only does it, not only do I feel like I help them, they help me every day in my everyday living skills also, because I feel like they depend on me for a lot of things. Um, I have, we have a lot going on in this day program. I'm sorry, somebody just left their phone in this office and nobody's in the building. Sorry if you keep hearing it in the background. Um, I run a sensory motor class here. I'm an activity coordinator and I do a lot of hands-on. I have my own 
class here in the day program. Hopefully it'll be up and running again in a couple of weeks. We've been closed, but um, a lot of motor skills, a lot of sensory stuff. Um, our day program offers cooking classes, sign language, um, exercise class. We do outings. We have a full kitchen. We have two full kitchens here. We do a lot of that. We have a lot of outings we go on. We did also, like Christina was saying, we did Zoom during the pandemic. We did all of our cooking. We did all of our um, participation on Zoom. And we did the dance, exercise. We did all kinds of stuff. But for the most part, um, for me, staying as long as I've been here is just everything besides just the staff. It definitely is not the pay. So <laughs> hold on for one second. Val, your phone's right here. I know. Okay, no problem. No problem. It's okay. I told you there was somebody's phone that was in there. I'm sorry. Um, well, I think that's one of the things I actually love about um, about our direct service uh, professionals is you just never know what the day is going to bring, right? I think one of the things, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, I'm hearing from you and, and from Christina here, it's the variety. It, it's the every day something's new, right? And and yes. all the different things, even bones being left behind, right? It's no, right. I always say it's never boring, right? <laughs> yeah, and so. we have a transportation company here that we have a fleet of buses so we're always out and about in the community which we enjoy a lot uh, when weather permits right now it's a little chilly out but we still find things to do we can go to the movies we can do all kinds of, in summer gardening we do a lot yeah but productive meaningful lives it. yeah i enjoy great. it great well, I think that kind of transitions us to kind of a few final comments from everybody, if you don't mind. I do think that at the end of the day, in addition to our organization, there is something intrinsic, right? Something deep down within us that makes us passionate and compassionate in the work that we do. And so uh, while we still have a couple of minutes here, I'd love to go around one more time. And if, if each of you could share a little bit about, you know, how, why, uh, you know, how the work that we do creates productive meaningful days for ourselves right in addition to the support that we provide hoping to create productive meaningful days for those who use our services so um lupita do you want to go ahead and get us started again so um yeah it's been a passion of mine throughout my whole life to really be part of the community and also helping others be part of our community through art dance singing um so that's always been a passion of mine so that's one of our our core missions in alchemy is to help people really be part of our arts community and have their visions and voices heard so i feel really attuned with alchemy in that way and it's um yeah it's it's um it's very fulfilling thank you thank you christina do you have something to add Yes, what keeps me passionate is the consumers, all of them. Um, like I said, you build these relationships with them and you help them and they also help you to grow and to learn about them and about their, their life in general and what they can and what they can't do. That's what kept me here, or I should say keeps me here. Yeah, I always think about my DSP days, and I do feel like I always learned more each and every single day than I ever gave. So it, I, I, that really resonates with me. Sandra, what would you like to add? For me, I you know what? I missed the beginning of your question. I'm so sorry. This was off. Um, oh, no, it's okay. Just kind of the deep down, like what's kind of fueled your passion in the work that you do? Oh, hmm. <laughs> um, I love helping others. I love helping others and um, I can feel when I'm working with um, the people that I serve and you know I've been here for a long time it becomes like a second family I spend all my days here so it is plus I was going to say I'm a grandmother of 10 so I'm used to being around a lot of people <laughs> but um, I like it I mean I, I like to 
be the care provider for them that when I walk in the room that they know that I'm going to be there to help them to do whatever they whatever they need for their everyday living agenda um, we do it like I said we do a lot so that's all I can think of right now I'm sorry no don't be thank you so much all of you for for sharing what keeps you motivated and passionate in the work that we do um, it's uh, the most amazing work, and I really hope that you're able to take advantage of some of these new initiatives and things we've been hearing about throughout the webinar today. Um, but at the end of the day, if it wasn't for, for people like you doing such a wide range of things with people each and every day, um, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to truly serve and support those out in our disability community. So I just wanna thank you again for being here today. And did you wanna add one more thing, Sandra? I did, I wanna, I wanna um, find out about Lupita Chavez. I wanna find out about her program. I'm really like, we do, yeah, art. I was the art director also. So I'm interested in seeing her program. All right, we'll get the two of you connected again. Yay. All right. <laughs> well, thank you all. Um, we really appreciate you. you being here today. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and so now I'd like to hand the webinar back over to my Disability Thrive partner, Barry. Thanks, Amber, and um, thank you so much, Sandra, Lupita, and uh, Christina for sharing your your thoughts and, and your uh, feelings about being a DSP. It's um, it's just wonderful to hear uh, and such an important component of today's webinar. Um, we're going to transition to kind of the second phase of today's webinar, which is uh, to really focus on our reflections on the Disability Thrive Initiative uh, training series. This is the last webinar in the series, so we thought it would be a wonderful time to um, bring on the director of the department, Nancy Bargeman, uh, the director of Department of Developmental Services, to share with us some thoughts on the purpose and intent of the Disability Thrive Initiative, we are incredibly grateful and honored to have been partners uh, with DDS in, in delivering this over the past couple of years. So uh, Director Bargeman, thanks for being with us today and um, sharing your perspective on, on Disability Thrive Initiative. Thank you, Barry. Um, and I really, really appreciate the opportunity to, to join um, today's event and this isn't the first one that I've joined, and I'm always just really um, humbled when I hear all the great work that everybody's doing and um, the leadership that Disability Thrive is doing. And um, I am super pleased to be able to hear from the direct service professionals and the commitment in, um, wow, 24 years and listening to kind of what the motivation is, is, is always inspiring. Um, so I, I do want to just kind of share a little bit of the background as to what led into Disability Thrive. And, and while we were facing the pandemic in 2020, you know, we knew that we really needed to provide flexibility and um, really take a look at how we're going to be able to provide kind of alternative services for individuals and providers so we could have services for um, you know, really across the state and also support our providers. Um, and, but we knew we couldn't do it alone. Um, when we were looking at ways to be able to kind of make policy decisions, which led to alternative services, that is, that's only one piece of kind of the, the tools in the toolbox that we needed to be able to navigate through kind of a whole new environment as a result of the pandemic. And so what did we do? We, we went to our kind of community partners, many of the providers and associations, and you know, really started brainstorming about what is it that we needed to do? And that's how we started looking at the alternative services. But then how do we kind of promote and lift up the flexibility and innovation? Um, and that's where the concept of Disability Thrive um, kind of came up. I, you know, certainly, um, the leaders of Disability Thrive are the ones that had identified and branded the name and, and really looked at what was going to be meaningful to the community. And that's where a technical assistance and training service was, was evolved from. Um, we, we also saw that there was quite a few providers that really kind of adapted to that flexibility and innovation and quickly made that pivot. Um, but we also knew that for a variety of reasons, that there were some that really struggled in, in trying to see how they were going to be able to pivot and using the expertise of those that have been able to 
kind of make that innovation and um, lean into it and use that as part of kind of their new environment of delivering services. And so making those connections was extremely invaluable. Um, and that's what Disability Thrive did you know, providing that training and like I said, some of the technical assistance and making those connections. And how did they do it? You know, they really had the vision of being able to look at statewide webinars using the benefit of, you know, how we can use Zoom and, and um, have a statewide resource. Um, that was certainly one of the great takeaways of so many things that were devastating about the pandemic. But one of the good things is that we've been able to connect statewide and do things that we haven't been able to do. They highlighted you know, individuals who are receiving services that were sharing their experiences, really able to showcase some of the exciting things that providers and families and um, self-advocates, direct service professionals were doing to provide that inspiration, but then also using an opportunity to see if there is advice that they could help kind of guide folks. Um, they really provide kind of this practical way to deliver um, some takeaways and share that information, again, through webinars and then also other, other ways that they were able to make those connections through, you know, lunch and learns, they had activities, they were able to develop a resource library, you know, really having a team to see how they were going to do a broad outreach. Um, they created that space for that community collaboration, that encouragement and being able to learn together. Change is never easy, but it's always easier when you have somebody to do it with, you know, that you're not in it by yourself, that you could really look and learn from others or share your expertise with somebody else. And what I think wasn't as visible to the broader community, but it just is it's same importance and um, it definitely invaluable was really the leadership within Disability Thrive of having that commitment um, to carry the voice of the community to the department. Um, they were able to share what they were hearing, the concerns, you know, what was working, what wasn't working, how could we get information out broader. So they became truly a trusted partner um, to regional centers and to the department to be able to um, share information that maybe we just have not um, were aware of. Um, so, you know, over the course of the couple of years, we had asked them to come back for a 2022 series um, because we recognized that there still was change that was underway. And um, to our great delight, um, the team said, yes, we can do it. Um, and they said they will help us stay informed um, with the community and stay, they would stay engaged and have the seminars throughout this year. We're now at the end of the year. Um, I'm so pleased with the work that they did. We were right in asking them to do, kind of extend their time in this this work. Um, and I think you are seeing really kind of the results of that um, as you are experiencing it today. So I do really want to thank, you know, Barry Giardini, Amber, Carrie, Navarrete, and uh, there's a whole team behind the Disability Thrives leadership. You know, the, what you've done has just been remarkable and um, really does demonstrate the leadership and partnership that really can make a difference. And really thank you for helping developmental services through the journey, supporting direct service professionals, um, self-advocates and so many others. So thank you, um, Barry and Amber and others. And uh, again, appreciate the moment to be able to share some thoughts and um, we'll hand it back to you. Well, thank you so much, Director Bargeman, for those kind words. And uh, you really took quite a few words out of my mouth when it comes to the relationships, the connection, and the building of community throughout these last years. It has been such the highlight to the work that we've done. And uh, we could not have done it without the support of the Department of Developmental Services. And like you said, so many more people who are part of our team. And so thank you again for being here today. All right, so um, next slide. 
So as indicated, we actually do have a huge Disability Thrive Initiative team, and we would like to give out a few thank yous. We do have some more information to come, so hold tight, but we would be remiss if we didn't honor all the hard work that goes into what we do. I know Barry and I are the primary people that you see with our team, um, but as you can see just here on the slide, there are many, many more people um, who make things happen behind the scenes, so a huge thank you to Laura Glassman, our accessibility advisor, Ivy Fan, our communications and graphic design, also uh, moving slides behind the scenes, uh, things people don't realize. Many people know Lendy from kicking off our webinars, but she does so much more for our team with the Spanish resources and hosting the lunch and learns. Lauren Bettendorf Dow with our communications and production and just a total guru all the way around with everything. Thank you, Will. Sanford for consulting on policy and content development and Laurel Mildred just holding the whole ship together and moving us forward as our consultant project manager this year. And of course, my amazing partner in crime, Barry Giardini. Next slide. So it actually takes a lot more people than just that. Um, as you can see here, we have a whole webinar production team, a communications team, and all of our amazing agency liaisons, Julia Lowe, Lori Sorensen, Kate Kinnamont, and Rebecca Helgeson. So thank you to all of our extended team members. Next slide. And our accessibility providers, I know all of you out there know them, but we love them and could not be able to bring all of this content to our broad and diverse community without them. So a huge thank you to uh, all of our interpreting team and translation team and everybody else who, who helps us be as accessible as possible. Next slide. And of course, there would be no Disability Thrive Initiative if it wasn't for our funders, the Department of Developmental Services and San Diego Regional Center. Next slide. And all of our content expert, we couldn't have these amazing informative resources and content and community building if it wasn't for everybody who was a part of our presentation teams this year. Next slide. If it wasn't for all of these people, we would not as a community be able to continue to thrive with uh, armed with the knowledge and resources we need to be successful in the services supporting people each and every day. Next slide. So now I'd like to hand it back over to Barry Giardini to help reflect on some of that information and content, that wonderful presentations that we've had throughout 2022. Take it away, Barry. Thanks, Amber. Um, so I'm just going to run us through a quick recap of, of the ground that we covered over the course of the second phase of the Disability Thrive Initiative, um, at, which will lead well into um, a presentation by Ivy, who will run you through the resource library. And all of this will, will exist in the resource library. So we started out um, helping California address the direct uh, support professional workforce focused on the DSP staff stability survey, a workforce survey that the department was uh, working on, the department came and presented on that, really helped, uh, helped to drive engagement um, in, in that uh, process, which Catherine spoke about earlier, the number of uh, vendors that responded. So we will finally have a snapshot of what's going on really in our system. Um, then we moved on, next slide, please. And uh, next slide. In our next webinar, we really focused on the restoration of social rec and camp services. This is something that I know advocates pushed for for a very long time to try to get this service back. And we wanted to highlight and emphasize uh, what was available and try to really jumpstart that program. Um, so we, we had that webinar on social rec and camp. Um, and I will move on. Next slide, please. Just because we're short on time, I know we're running a little over today, everyone. Thanks for sticking with us. Uh, in webinar three, we really focused on uh, the supporting healthy aging for Californians with disabilities, and we had great uh, partnership with uh, folks from the, uh, the Department of Aging who came on and talked about the master plan for aging and how it intersects with uh, people with disabilities. And we talked about health disparities um, for people with disabilities. So uh, that was a really great opportunity for us to focus on that particular population of our community. Um, next slide, please. And then in webinar four, I'm going quick here, I promise. 
um, we, we really wanted to emphasize uh, some of the department's proposals and policies around expanding employment services. So we talked about uh, increasing pathways to employment, competitive strategies to get to competitive integrated employment, um, and other things, uh, including supporting folks with high, high support needs to try to achieve success in employment outcomes. Um, next slide, please. And all of these slides will be available. I know I'm going quickly. Um, last month, you, you may well recall, we had the department on again as well to talk about some of the changes to the tailored day service and some opportunities that we can really focus on person-centered services, individualized services for folks through Taylor Day to help um, maintain flexibility going forward as we enter into the next year, but also really just hyper-focus on meeting individual uh, people's needs. So the department came in and talked about some of those new policy changes. We had regional center uh, representation on as well from Kern to talk about how regional centers can support that and brought in a provider as well to really kind of emphasize and bring to life, put some color on um, the Taylor Day service program. So I mentioned all of this will exist in our resource library. And next slide, please. Now we're going to have Ivy Fan, uh, one of the key members of our team, is just in a tremendous job, uh, run us through the Disability Thrive Initiative resource library so that we show you where, where all of these great materials are going to continue to exist. Ivy, take it away. Hi everyone, my name is Ivy. It is my pleasure to share with all of you some quick, simple, but very essential information about our website today. So even though our DTI phase two has finally come to an end, please keep in mind that our tools and resources will remain on our website for the disability community, families, and caregivers permanently. To visit our website, you can simply go to disabilitythriveinitiative.org. When you come here, you'll notice that we have multiple jump links to direct visitors to our Spanish, Chinese, and Tagalog pages, as well as our resource library and previous webinar section very quickly and easily. For example, when you click on a resource library, you'll be able to jump directly to that section on the website right away. So when you're there, you'll be able to find a lot of helpful information and resources that we have collected from both DTI Phase 1 and Phase 2. There are so many resources, including URLs to various websites, flyers organized in different categories, which include technology use and access, virtual services, disability services management, community hybrid services, and so much more. Right below the resource library, you'll also find another equally important section called Previous Webinars which houses everything we have produced for the past 25 webinars since 2021 on various topics from COVID-19, person center services, cultural diversity, LGBTQ plus disability community, and more. You can explore all archived materials, including full webinar recordings and all presentation slide decks in English and Spanish. And as you scroll down to the bottom of the page, you'll also find multiple URLs with icons um, that will direct you to our social media platforms, including Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and most importantly, our YouTube channel. And this is where you can find and watch all series of ETI webinars in the past that we have put together for the community. As you navigate through the channel, you'll find a many lists of highlight video clips created from every single webinar. And most of these videos are available in both English and Spanish. We hope that you all find this user-friendly website and other social media platforms to be accessible from any device 24 over seven. And, and hopefully this will become your one-stop resource center available for the disability community for years to come. So now I'm going to hand it over to Lenny Ruano who will be sharing with you even more information about accessibility and Spanish materials on our website. Lendi, please take it away. Thank you. Awesome, thank you so much, Ivy. Um, I will try to go as quickly as possible, but not too fast for the interpreters. Um, as you may know, Disability Drive Initiative has been committed to making our events accessible for all. 
So today I want to share just a few tips and tools that will help improve your events, presentations, trainings, and expand your marketing. So the first one is creating an accessible PowerPoint. So what is an accessible PowerPoint? An accessible PowerPoint is just one that has alternative text, one that has easily to read font, and that passes color contrast. This is something that you can do on your own. However, you can always find companies online that specialize in remediation. If you choose to do it on your own, I do recommend you visit the Department of Rehab website where you can find material and trainings on creating accessible PDFs and a lot more. If you use Microsoft software, you can find more information and step-by-step -step instructions on their website. Uh, next slide, please. Sign language. Whether you're in person or online, if you do not or are unsure about your audience, best practice is to provide sign language to promote accessibility for all. Sign language can be provided in American Sign Language, International Sign Language, and any other language necessary. Again, make sure you do your research for prices and requirements before you hire someone. A really quick tip would be to watch your pace when you're speaking if you have a language interpreter. Next slide, please. CART services and closed captioning services. So CART stands for Computer Assisted Real-Time Translation and closed captioning we typically see as CC. These are two different methods of writing what you're seeing, what you are saying in a written form. And so make sure that you do understand the differences between both of them. Now you do have software that provides this for you for free and some of that would be like zoom um, if you go to zoom go to the settings you select closed captioning on and voila here you go you have closed captioning but with this keep in mind that you do risk happen that you do risk automated closed captioning to not be as correct as it should be or to have mistakes in between it. To avoid this issue, here at DTI, we did hire a closed captioner to do live captioning during our events. And it's something that you might want to consider depending on the event you're presenting. Language interpretation. Now be aware that you do have options for language interpretation. You have simultaneous or consecutive interpretation. So make sure that you are aware of the differences between both of them. When hiring someone to provide language interpretation, you want to make sure that there is a clear understanding of the language, the type of interpretation needed, and we do highly recommend that you do consider culture competency when, when providing language interpretation. Next slide, please. Now, plain language. It is the law for state and federal agencies to use plain language, and it should be the norm or best practices for all of us here. Some things to consider are using headings, lists, and tables, which make an easier read. Limit the paragraphs to one per paragraph, and use everyday words. You want to find words that are common, you want to exclude excessive language, and you can find a lot of resources for free, including tools, trainings online, on YouTube, and our webpage as well. Next slide, please. Um, this PowerPoint, as you all know, will be accessible to everybody. All the links for accessibility are live, so you can click on them. You can also find them on our resource library. Something to keep in mind with accessibility is that it does cost money and it should be something that you might want to consider including in your budget when it comes to making sure that you're accessible for everyone. Now, with that said, I just wanna say thank you to everyone for your time. Gracias a todos. And I am returning it back to you, Barry. Thanks so much, Lundy. And, and as we get real close to the end here, we, we thought we'd be remiss if we did not uh, give an opportunity um, to Mark Klaus, the executive director at the San Diego Regional Center, to provide just a, a few comments around the Disability Thrive Initiative and how it's helped through the pandemic. Mark uh, previously worked as an executive director at a provider organization at the beginning of Disability Thrive, and has been an incredible partner um, with us as we've as we've gone through phase two. Um, Mark, we appreciate you so much. Thank you for being here with us today and and kind of getting us to the close here. 
Well, I appreciate Barry. I, I appreciate the invitation. Um, I, I, I have a unique perspective. Um, some people say I'm unique, but I think I'll just say I have a unique perspective coming in, as, as Barry mentioned. Uh, you know, as, as we were kicking off the, the Thrive Initiative, uh, I was a vendor and the opportunity to work with the DTI work group looking at uh, different options, different services. Um, and what I what I recall was open, honest uh, communications, so much collaboration uh, amongst vendors working with DDS, working with CDSA and Easter Seals. People were were and continue to be so willing to share their expertise, their knowledge, um, best practices, and thoughts. Uh, you know, in November, I was uh, moved over to the regional center system as a director of San Diego Regional Center. And really got to work with uh, the DTI group in, in a different uh, capacity, uh, negotiating the contract uh, for this year. Uh, I think, as Nancy, Director Bargeman mentioned, there was some hesitancy in terms of, you know, is this really needed or uh, is this the time to do this? And, um, you know, here we are at the end of 2022. And the answer to that is yes. Um, looking at the topics that were covered earlier. Um, and we continue to to change. We change by the the month, by the day, sometimes by the hour. And uh, you know, as I look at the statement on the Thrive Initiative, you know, a statewide statewide resource collaborative that helps navigate changes to services and supports. Um, I would say this this has checked those boxes. And I I want to thank Director Bargeman and her team for their initiative, their creativity in moving this forward. Barry and his team, Amber and her team, and, and everybody that participated. This was a, a Herculean lift, um, but the willingness to share information, be open, be honest, have those difficult discussions has, has been great for our system, great for vendors, great for regional centers, great for our clients and their families. So I want to say thank you, and I'll turn it back over to you, Barry. Thanks so much, Mark. We really, really appreciate you. Um, we are going to just encourage everyone now to join us on Friday um, for our final lunch and learn as well. Um, it is Friday from 12 to 1. We will be focusing on the workforce component of today's webinar. Uh, during that lunch and learn, Amber will be running the show there per usual. Um, so please do come out. It's a, it's a great opportunity to connect and, and have a, a dialogue in a different format um, from what we covered uh, today. Um, and with that, I think, uh, you know, we, we are at the thank yous and goodbyes. We've, we thanked a lot of folks today. Um, I didn't get a chance yet to formally and publicly thank you, Amber, and your team for all the great work. Um, it's been an absolute honor and a pleasure to work with you on Disability Thrive Initiative. You all are the best of the best. And um, to everyone who's been on this, um, supported it, uh, we, we are so grateful. And ultimately, to the many folks who, who log in every month to be part of this with us. It means a ton. We love this community and have really valued being part of your lives. Amber. Yeah, thank you so much, Barry. Uh, the partnership that um, we have made through the Disability Thrive Initiative, I have a feeling will live on in new and different ways in the future. And that goes to all of you out there as well. We can't thank you though. Um, enough for your collaboration, your openness, your connection through um, these couple of years. And we hope that each and every single one of you finds more and new ways to connect and collaborate with each other so that we all as a disability community continue to thrive no matter what uh, changes continue to come in the future. So thank you all. Thank you for those of you who have um, stayed with us extra long today so we could wrap some things up and we wish you the very, very best. See you Friday at the Lunch and Learn. <laughs>